Hey OCF, my name is Maggie Kanjalko. I'm a student at the University of Pittsburgh and I also serve as the Mid-Atlantic Regional Student Leader. Now this month's theme is Redeeming the Time, so I'm going to be visiting Holy Transfiguration Monastery in Elwood City to learn more about how monastics redeem their time and maybe how we can apply that to our lives as college students. Madden starts at 7 a.m., so I'll see you there bright and early. The Orthodox Monastery of the Transfiguration was founded in 1967 by Mother Alexandra, previously known as Princess Ileana of Romania. It is under the jurisdiction of the Orthodox Church in America. Mother Alexandra founded the monastery with the goal of providing a place for American Orthodox women of all backgrounds to experience monastic life. Today I'll be interviewing the abbess of the monastery, Mother Christophora, along with Mother Paula. I'm Mother Christophora. I'm the abbess of the monastery of the Transfiguration in Elwood City, Pennsylvania. And I'm Mother Paula, and uh, I'm one of the mothers in the monastery. So our theme for this month is redeeming the time. That's actually picked from Ephesians 5.16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I wanted to come to the monastery and kind of learn about how you do things here and how you go about your day. How might you view time differently than someone who doesn't live in a monastery? The church marks time. We have a cycle of services, not only the yearly cycle, like we have Lent, we have Pascha, we have Christmas, we have Dormition and all that. That's a yearly cycle, but we have a daily cycle. Um, our Vespers transitions us from Thursday into Friday or whatever. Uh, so we're marking that time of the setting of the sun. And then in the morning at the sunrise, we pray again together, the matin service or altar service. And that's for the rising of the sun, the beginning of a new day, the thanking God for the light. And then through the day, we have the liturgical hours. So we have the first hour, third hour, sixth hour, and ninth hour. And again, that's reminding us of something in, in the life of Christ. So we're, we stop what we're doing, we go back to church, even if it's a short service, like the third hour. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're just marking that time and re reminding ourselves, coming back to thanking God, really. Um, so that would be one liturgical way. As far as work, we also feel like we don't have enough time. <laughs> so the gospel reading of Martha and Mary is important there uh, because, of course, Martha is caught up in tasks and duties and responsibilities and doing nice hospitality, and she misses the point. So we can give ourselves to, the, to Christ. We can come live in a monastery for years, and yet we could still have to focus on the wrong thing. We wanted to accomplish, we wanted to write a book, or we wanted to pay, paint an icon, mm -hmm. or we want to have a big dinner and invite all the poor. Those are all good things, well, pious, holy things. Um, but if we're so caught up in the project that we forget to listen to God, hear God, talk to God, um, spend time with God, sit at his feet of the Lord Jesus, then, then that's, the, that's our, our risk, just as it, as it is for the world. I think the difference is, though, that we have reminders of God all around us. In the monastery, the walls are surrounded by icons. The bell is going to ring. It's time for church. We go back to church. We have something to do, different parts of the day. There's always, it's not like, well, what am I going to do now? We're going to do Vespers, and it's the 19th or whatever of February, whatever it is, and we know exactly because the church is going to tell us how to do Vespers on that day. Mm -hmm. Now, I was... Um, Thinking about myself um, as a student, we used to start our day in public school with a prayer or a psalm. Mm -hmm. But in my lifetime, then um, I guess the Supreme Court or whoever said you couldn't do that. But I discovered through the grace of God that I could still pray in school silently in my mind or also in my heart because the altar, the heart is the altar, our altar. So our heart is our altar. We always have a temple, we are a temple, we always have the ability to pray. So I discovered that as a young person in school, and I discovered I could still pray. So I, I would, I would pray during the day or change classes in high school. And the same with college, like I went to, uh, you know, a campus where you had to walk a distance between buildings and between classes. And 
Well, maybe I had a monastic calling because I, I would pray during that time. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit was teaching me to pray. That's how we learned to pray. Mm -hmm. We have prayer books and we have to use our Orthodox prayer books, but we also have our, our own intimate relationship with God, our own personality, which is very unique. For me, to get myself where I'm supposed to be, um, I do use my cell phone just as a timer to, to ring my alarm to tell me it's, you know, five minutes before lunch, I need to get to lunch, you know. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a lunch bell, we have a church bell, but usually by the time we read the church, ring the church bell, we're in church, you mm -hmm. know. But um, so, so we, we, the clock kind of does regulate us, but it keeps us regulated on our liturgical cycle. And then mm -hmm. in between, you know, maybe we're going to have a meeting with the abbess or we're going to have a discussion group or maybe somebody's coming, there's going to be a tour or whatever. So, so we have to, you know, the clock does help us keep, you know, scheduled and try to be on time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Smile. She's a former OCFer. Yay, OCF. <laughs> um, both of you had mentioned how like the, the liturgical time kind of dictates tends to dictate your schedule here in the monastery. Um, now for students, unfortunately, I'm I don't have as many opportunities to spend time in church. What do you feel that I can take away from the monastic approach and like try to incorporate the liturgical cycle in my life as a college student? Before I came to the monastery, I was an elementary teacher. And um, I didn't really pray as a child, even though I grew up in the church. I did. I didn't. I just knew the Lord's Prayer. I knew the Creed. You know, mm -hmm. but I didn't really have much of a prayer life as a as an elementary kid, or as a high school, or as a college kid. I have to be honest. After I got my job and was more back into the church and trying to follow a cycle, like at noon, right before it was time to go to lunch, I had a little what half hour, forty five minute break from the kids. On my desk, I had the prayer of the hours, mm -hmm. and that's what we pray at um, at the end of each hour, at end of first hour, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour. So it's just just a tiny little paragraph. I keep it on my desk, or to keep it in your pocket, um, and then just remind yourself or set your phone uh, for at twelve noon, and just stop if you can, if you're not in class or whatever, or close to noon. Mm -hmm. um, just take that prayer out or put it on your phone and. And just read that prayer and then you're thinking of God and you're thanking him for whatever's happening right that day. Now we're getting close to Nativity. We have a, an Akathis hymn um, uh, for Christmas and then we've been singing that and chanting it on Sunday mornings. The one verse is, Jesus Emmanuel, come and fill us with the joy of your presence. So I really like that, you know, um, so... I've been trying to say that more during the day that I am saying the Jesus prayer right now, just to remember as a that season. as a season, it's a mm -hmm. seasonal thing, you know, and you and you can change it for whatever feast day is going on, you know, mm -hmm. you know, Lord, who was transfigured on the mountain, you know, have mercy on me or, or whatever, just to kind of keep you focused on what's, what's happening. But it's easy to get busy in the monastery too. You have to, like, like mother said about being Martha and Mary, sometimes I think I'm definitely a Martha. So I have to watch that my work does not totally consume me or dictate me and know when to stop and when to be quiet and get ready for the next event or service because, you know, you could just keep working, you know. So mm -hmm. you have to have some discipline in that. And, um, but it's not always easy. And sometimes you don't have your own schedule because, like, when you're in school, you know, you have to go by the your college schedule, you know, and... But what I think is important is how you use your free time. Um, and obviously we need to relax. Everybody needs to relax a little bit and have downtime because it's you know, good for your soul too, just to stop and be quiet. You highlighted the importance of rest, of free time, also, you know, balancing work and liturgical life. What role does work play in the life of monastic? And how can you sanctify, how does work, how can you sanctify your time, even during work time? St. Anthony had a vision. He was asking God how to live, St. Anthony in the desert. So he saw another monastic in this vision, an angel dressed like a, a monk. And that uh, angel would would do handwork for so many minutes, like 15, 20 minutes. And then he would 
put that down and stand up and go to Zykon and he'd pray for a while and then he could come back and do handwork. So we're showed that, that we really can't stay in prayer all the time. Mm -hmm. we, we can be in a state of prayer, but literally praying all the time, um, using all those words. Well, we can't do that. So work, work kind of balances that sometimes especially handwork can calm us down. Each sisters assign some task. So some of the nuns are blessed to serve in the altar, to take her, clean the altar. They assist the priest like an altar boy would do or an altar server. Um, so they have that responsibility. Um, others take care of the mail. Some do the cooking, some do the shopping, um, some do the driving, some take care of gardens in the summer flower gardens, vegetable gardens. So we, we need that kind of work. It kind of calms us down or sewing um, because if we're just talking all the time or in a crowd all the time. So I, I think the work kind of helps to focus us a bit. And here in a small monastery, we're, we're doing most of our jobs alone. We do the dishes together. So you saw that. <laughs> and the cooks, there's a few cooks, cooks up together yeah, and more the dishwasher in the same time. Yeah, but most of our jobs are, are kind of on the. So it's 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 something human nature needs because even before the fall, even before Adam and Eve's sin, they were created and God gave them a very beautiful cre creation, and told them to enjoy their life in the garden. But they, he he also told them to take care of the garden and till it. So even before the fall, man was working. God gave us this intellect to order our life and to do to do work. Remember God told Adam to name the animals. So he was he was called to to do things, take care of the garden, name the animals, organize his life. And so that's very much part of human nature. So monasteries have work, monastics need work, handy hand work, quiet work, labor, gardening as I said, or if technology that's changed our work. How we do our work because mm -hmm. a lot of us um, work on computers because of emails and it's like scheduling guests and communication and even mother just communicates with us by emails and for prayer requests too we get a lot of prayer requests by emails whenever we're going to start work well for me personally i found this prayer several years ago and it's written by one of the um optina fathers and it's a nice little short prayer Something like, it starts like, Oh God, be attentive unto helping me. Oh Lord, make haste to help me. Direct, oh Lord God, everything I think, say, do, work to the glory of your holy name. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just try to say that prayer too before I start to... Um, and the nuns in the kitchen, they have a prayer on the wall that they mm -hmm. read before they start. I'm Mother Galena, and I'm the kitchen manager here at the monastery. Um, when we start any cooking in the monastery... We have St. Ephrosinus, the cook, here to help us, and we also have prayers that we start at the beginning and ending of our cooking. Um, he helps us many times and saves us when we have problems. We always ask his help when we're in the middle of something. But everything you do in the monastery is redeemed in God's time with prayer, and you don't just do it for yourself. You're doing it for the Lord and for uh, people that are coming here to eat. And people often say, we use the same recipe. Why is your food so good? And we think it's because it's prepared with prayer. Because of the prayer. Yeah. Or, or it could just be make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or the prayer to the Holy Spirit, O Heavenly King. You know, something short, um, just, just to kind of say, okay, because this is going to be from God, and how will I respond to what email I'm going to read or this text I'm going to read or whatever. Beep goes off, and whatever you're doing, you stop. You know, pick up the phone, you know, what is it, you know, and, and sometimes you feel like you have to answer it like right away, you know, and it's, it can control you. And I remember Father Thomas Hauko used to serve here. He would say, if you get an email, you don't have to answer it right away. Why don't you just wait 24 hours before you answer it? You have time to think about it a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes we want to, sometimes we're like really quick to respond and maybe what comes out of our mouth or what we type or text is not proper. You know, we can react to things, you know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's maybe just maybe wait five, ten minutes or something. Think about something about before how you're going to how you're gonna respond to that text or that email. Because it, it can control you. And sometimes it's we get compulsive and obsessive about stuff. You need to know when to turn your phone off. And especially going to church or wherever you're going to 
be praying, you know, just put it on silence and just try to not get distracted. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Thankfully, I got to partake in a meal with you. Before I came to the monastery, my dad told me, oh, don't talk during the meal. They're not going to talk, so don't be chattering while they're eating their meals. I came and I noticed we were listening to a talk from Father Thomas Hopko. So can you touch a little bit on like what does mealtime look like in a monastery? Many monasteries traditionally have a reading during, during a meal. So that as we feed our body, we're also feeding our soul. In an American monastery in our society, this is what I found out being an abbess. I've been an abbess for many, many years. It was easier to read during lunch than it was to actually get along with the sister next to you. So imagine in your growing up, if every day you came to the supper table, there were some guests. Mm -hmm. So that would be one factor that's challenging. And then also imagine growing up that if every day you came to your dinner table, you had been at school, you had played outside with your friends, you're sort of like excited about your day, wanted to share it. Mom or dad was going to read 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 to you while you ate. <laughs> so it didn't give you any time really to be a, to be a family and to share. Like some monsters that ring a bell, you start to eat, and they ring a bell, you start to drink. Another bell, the person's reading. Um, that much structure, I don't think, is going to um, uh, bless us and our society with what in the way that we need to grow. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. There are books that are... That mealtime where you all sit together seems as a way to like redeem your relationship with one another. Yes. Right, because that's the only meal that we actually gather for. We, have, we do breakfast on our own and suppers. We have leftovers. We have a common room where we can come and go as we please during the evening and in the morning. There are different traditions, but, but the abbess is going, it's going to be very organic. So the abbess is going to make some choices and see what she thinks the community needs. So I thought it, it was much harder to be a family and, and talk as a family and love each other than it was to have a reading. So I challenge us. Most of the time I'm eating my meals alone. Do you think that that's like a particular time that I can take? Like, how can I redeem uh, mealtime in particular? Um, you could listen to a podcast while you're eating. Sometimes I do that in the evening or maybe listen to some music some that might be helpful so you don't feel so lonely. <laughs> it could be nice, quiet downtime for your yeah. soul because you can be alone with God and be alone with yourself, actually. Mm -hmm. Even if you're, in, it's, it's kind of a lot to expect that we're always going to be thinking about God and communing with him. Sometimes we just need to be in communion with ourselves. Like, mm -hmm. I find that going on a walk helps me to debrief what happened during the day. And I just try to use that time to thank God, even if it's struggles or good things or mm -hmm. problems that I'm worried about or having anxiety about something. If I just like talk it through and just start thanking him for everything that happened that day and think about it, you know, or sometimes it doesn't happen until I get to my cell closer to bedtime and I think about the whole day. You know what a prostration is, you make the mm -hmm. cross and you bow down on your knees and then you touch your head to the floor, it's called a prostration. I think you all know that from Lent. But when we wake up in the morning, we're supposed to do a lot of those, and, and but that would be the rhythm. Um, so so that's the rhythm that the monastics have. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and go down, make a prostration. Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. So that physical um, rhythm and part of our prayer too. It's, mm -hmm. it, it helps. The rhythm helps. And I think it's good, too, to kind of, like, try to clear your head before you go to pray, if possible, or, you know, mm -hmm. if something's bothering you or just thinking about the day. Because sometimes if you don't and you go to say your evening prayers, then you're trying to pray and then everything starts popping into your head yes. about what happened. And then you kind of get distracted in your prayer. Or you maybe mm -hmm. read the prayer and like, did I really read that prayer? Because mm -hmm. then my mind went off to something that happened earlier in the day, you know? Mm -hmm. So if it's takes work to kind of quiet yourself down before you even pray, mm -hmm. you know. 
And there's always going to be distractions, so not to get upset about it. It's just, it's just the way it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And you just gotta just work through it and ask push your guardian, it push, mm -hmm. keep pushing, you know, and ask your guardian angel to help you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I knew an old monk. He taught this prayer to the. He was a a, a monk priest at a, a children's school in Israel, so he taught the girls this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on me. Teach me to taste no sweetness but thee. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Teach me to taste no sweetness but thee. And he taught them to say that during while they're eating. Oh, that's so beautiful. that's another. We need to say that when we're eating our desserts. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a wonderful prayer. I'll have to try that one. Yeah, I, I like how you talked about, um, like, quiet time and communion with yourself even before you take time to spend time with God. Um, and that's, like, the perfect segue because I'm really curious about the role of private time in a monastery. It seems like there there's quite an emphasis on, like, time alone or just, like, time to yourself. So why do we... Why do you have that emphasis? And I'm also curious to see, what do you do during your private time, if you don't mind me asking? I waste time. Me too. Just, you know, <laughs> I fritter it away. I look at too much news on my iPad. Time is part of the fallen world. It's, it's creation. So God doesn't live in time. He lives in, he's in eternity. And in, in the next life, we'll be in eternity. But time is part of this world. So it's given to us as a gift. We have time to spend. We have time to use. We have time to pray. We have all these things. Um, but being alone, personal time, private time, is a great gift. Because that's when we can enter in, into knowing ourselves, knowing God, being in communion, in communion with, with God. So in general, more people that join a monastery are introverts. So when we have free time, many of us like to be alone. All of us, we have a couple of extroverts, they like to do things together. So you see, we, 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 we have our human nature and, and we have to nurture ourselves in the, way that, in the way that works for us. Okay, we're gonna get ready to go to Vespers and we're gonna hear about some saints for the day, for the, the next day. And um, so I try, it doesn't always happen, just try to sit down for maybe 10 minutes before church starts, if I can, so I'm not rushing, um, to just to just to read about that saint or something, some small meditation or prayer so that I settle down before I get into church. Because if you're like working to the last minute and rush into church and then it's hard to settle down. Church or like maybe you're driving to church, you know, what are you, what are you listening to or what are you doing while you're driving to church? Or is, is it going to be something that's going to help you? focus um or is it should it, maybe we could just turn every all the noise off and just be quiet while you drive to church or walk to church well yeah and mother paul yeah. and i had we were invited to a, a liturgy recently we drove together to pittsburgh one sunday because we were invited there mother paul was, this, was driving and i said well i'll read the communion prayers mm. and so i brought the prayer book and she drove and i read the pre communion prayers and and that's just a way to, to use the time and then it was like, we prayed all the way to Pittsburgh, <laughs> saying those prayers. <laughs> Going off of that, what would advice would you give to somebody who feels like they don't have any private time? Or someone who feels like they're not able to carve out private time for themselves? I, it, I know you kind of touched on it earlier um, with like, saying prayers between classes. Do you have any other like practical suggestions like that? I think Father Hopko said once, you know, everybody should take quiet time or have time of silence every day. And then I think he said, <clears throat> I don't know if, oh, how many minutes he, he was said. quoting somebody. He was quoting somebody there's, else. There was yeah. a maxim. It's one of the, yeah. yeah. take if, 30 so, minutes of quiet time. Unless right. you're a really, really busy person with a lot of responsibility, then you need to take an hour. Yeah, right, that's right. He would always expand it, whatever, you know. So it was a busy person who needed more. The mother has um, on her phone at a certain time in the morning, around 11.15, she has a little alarm that goes off, and it's her thank you, God, alarm. So mm. she just stops and says, 
Thank you, God. The but phones they, can be very useful if you use them, uh -huh. you know, to your advantage. So one thing about work or prayer or talents or gifts or hobbies, all of them have one risk, and that's we can get proud. Yes. We can get proud of our grades in school. We can get proud of our compositions, our accomplishments, our athletic abilities, our talents. If we can paint or even paint icons, we can get proud of the way we sing in church. It's such a trap for everybody at every end of the spectrum. And of course, in school, it's usually we're proud of our grades. Like, oh, I worked really hard. I got this really good grade or wrote this paper and I thought of something nobody else thought of. And oh, so we just have to remember that it's all from God. It's not really us. Like no person have, has all the talents in the world. And that's the beautiful thing in church. In, in a parish, some, somebody's ordained to serve the liturgy. Somebody else is blessed to sing. Somebody else is blessed to read. But then you also have people who bake the prospera, who vacuum up the prospera crumbs in the church after the liturgy, decorate the icons or wash the windows, set up coffee, clean up coffee hour. There's so many things that we really need each other. So we shouldn't, if we have seemed like we feel like we have some great talent and accomplished something, um, just remember that we, we couldn't do it alone. We're doing it with God's help, but we're also doing it with each other's help. Because if we have a really nice lunch one day, um, or if some sister paints a really nice icon, like people will say, who, who cooked here? Or who did this garden? Or who painted that icon? And we'll be shy about answering because that sister could get proud. And then the other sisters could feel like, well, everybody notices the icon. Everybody notices the flower garden, but nobody notices that I wash the towels. Mm -hmm. then. Um, so we, we really need each other because if nobody was, was washing the towels or answering the phone, then that other sister who happens to have a, type, a talent of iconography wouldn't be able to paint an icon. So in a way, it takes the whole community. Sometimes you're asked to do things in the monastery that maybe you've never done before. And, and you think, oh, I don't have that talent. I don't have that gift. But it, you learn it and you develop it. And that happens when you go out in the world, too. You graduate from college and you're, you're you know, focused on one particular job. And then you get into that job and you're like, you know, I need some training <laughs> or whatever. We, we all need help with that. Uh, we can also be proud of our, of our work. And we can feel like it depends on us. Then all of a sudden we get cancer or we get COVID or, or somehow we even get the flu. And it's like, oh, now somebody else is going to do it. So it wasn't all me. So we, you know, we always have to remember that it's, it's, it's really God. And God is giving you the, the intelligence to do it. He's giving you the strength to do it. But there might be a day when you don't have, have that strength anymore. In college, I remember the the big thing was grades and then get into grad school. That was like, all they're doing when I was an undergraduate, all I was thinking, they're really only only helping me figure out how to get into grad school. They weren't helping me how to be a better person <laughs> or how to just exist on a bachelor's degree or what kind of, it was like, you'll need this. If you, if you want to go on to study this, you're going to need this. You're going to need this course. So you have to really back and say what do what how do I want to spend my life the, the your work can't define you and it does in our society in America we greet somebody we meet somebody what's what, your name where, where are you, you from do, and what, what do you do, do? right yeah. isn't that the big question and then when somebody gets sick paralyzed god forbid because that's so hard then they don't then they don't have that identity anymore but there's still a person. They're in may, made in the image and likeness of God, just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So whether it's your grandmother who has dementia in a nursing home, or maybe you have a brother who has Down syndrome or something, and it's like they're just as much image and likeness of God as I am with my big degree. And so, uh, so I have a cat, Pasha. I get... My winding down takes forever to wind down so I can start my evening prayers, my shower and all those things, reading in the evening. My cat is so smart. He didn't go to college, but he's smarter than I am because he's like, Christopher, it's time to go to bed. You're tired. So he'll go over to the bed. He'll put himself to bed and he'll look at me like, I think, oh, who's the educated one in this house? <laughs> 
Yeah, so he's teaching me about time. Mm. I think that you, when you talk about how a lot of times in, in America we put our identity on our on our work, I think that provides a great opportunity to pivot on the importance um, of resting. So, like for instance, how how much time do you get to rest in the monastery? Well, the monastic saying is the following: Saint that Benedict's rule: eight hours of work, eight hours of prayer, and eight hours of sleep. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Eight hours of work, eight hours of prayer, eight hours of sleep. Oh, we don't keep exactly that, but it gives you some idea. So, yes. Rest is a gift from God. Sleep is a gift from God. Sleep restores us mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So we do, and I don't get enough rest, and that's what my cat's trying to tell me. <laughs> it's time to rest. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's holy time also, uh, and we can't neglect it because it will hurt our health if we neglect it. I've learned that. I'm not sure I've corrected myself on it, but it's definitely that's definitely one of the things that happens to us. During COVID, um, when we slowed down and we didn't have a lot of guests and the whole schedule had changed, the uh, people coming and hospitality and all of that, we, we did learn that it's okay to, to slow down. And, and that's why we, we closed on Sunday afternoon and all day Mondays now, just for the community itself to rest and just still Sabbath. work. Yeah, just, yeah. just, you know, to slow down and not have that you know, guests leaving and the next guests are coming, you know, then another meal and then this. And so we can be together or we can just have a, a quiet day. A lot of times people will like, you know, if you see people, they'll say, well, how was your weekend? You know, and so, you know, how, how did you do this weekend? What was your weekend? And that, that sounds funny to us now because our weekend is in church, you know, you know but then. Well, it was the 33rd Sunday after Pentecost. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, um, but just, just knowing that, you know, on Sundays you can, you know, just have a little more. Knowing the rest is coming is, is restful yeah, itself. exactly. Mm -hmm. Knowing that it's coming, yeah. And so I'm sure it's just like for in school too, when you get those breaks and you know. Like it's sleep and ooh, sleep and sleep, you yes. know. Yeah. Most of the time when you get a break, you sleep, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's needed. And you don't know till you just slow down and how tired you really are. You didn't ask yeah. what our work is. What, what work do you do? <laughs> <laughs> our main work is to pray. <laughs> that's one. actually our main Number work. One. That's our job is right. is to do the do the liturgical cycle cycle on behalf of the world. That's mm -hmm. our main job, mm -hmm. and uh, we were taught here that if we do the prayers and keep the this pray for the world and and praise God and do the daily prayers, that He'll give us everything we need. We just basically do basic housework, uh, laundry, cooking, cleaning, and and uh, shopping and and correspondence and office work and balancing books and things like that, mailing lists. But the Lord provides everything we need. So we don't have a salary. We don't have a, a job. We don't come home with a paycheck. And God provides everything we need. It's a, a miracle. Yeah, it's a miracle that we have all of these buildings, all of these square foot, square footage of buildings, mm -hmm. roofs and and air conditioners that have to be paid for the electric bill and heat now in the winter. Um, yeah, so our Lord teaches us that. If you seek first the kingdom of God, everything you need will be prepared, given to you. Our elders here in our monastery, Father Roman, Mother Benedicta, they they didn't want us to set up a business. They they said, no, the Lord's going to take care of you if you just follow him and, and, do, and, and serve the Lord, do, pray to him welcome people here in his name, everything will be provided. So people bring us so many gifts and send donations, even without us asking for charitable donations, we receive more than we need. Do you have any parting words, any last final thoughts? Monastic life is a wonderful life. Don't, dis don't discount it from the possibilities of what you might do with your life. I do not regret one bit that I came here at age 29 and never left, thank God. One time I read in, in, the, in the Fathers that if everybody knew how beautiful life is in a monastery, how many blessings there are in a monastic life, and how much joy and peace and, and love there is, everybody would become a monastic. Everybody would come to the monastery. 
And then when you turn the page, it says, but if everybody knew how hard monastic life is <laughs> and how how much struggle and how much disappointment we have in ourselves and how much we have to work to change and to grow, nobody would join a monastery. Mother Alexandra, our foundress of the monastery, she has had said, you have to have a strong will to give up your will. Mm-hmm. So you, get, you have to give up your will a lot as a, as a single person or whatever in school, a student, a, a married couple um, in the monastery. We have to give up our will a lot because whatever God's calling you to do, if you have to help somebody or you're called in a different direction. So and hopefully you're, that you're giving up your will to, to do God's will. We hope that through this video, you got some inspiration on how to sanctify your time. Be sure to check out the curated discussion. We created it along with the interview to help you reflect and apply this to your lives.